We read this morning from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard John say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. By now, we know that this is the beginning of a new decade. If you did not know, we have, in fact, entered 2020. It's the beginning of a new time in our lives and in our country and the ending of an old. And the beginning of a new decade seems to inspire people to reflect even more than they ordinarily would at the end of any other year about how much things have changed in the past 10 years. It certainly has inspired people to do so in recent months as we ramped up to New Year's Eve and now into the first part of this decade. It's it's a time of people reflecting back in their personal lives of the kind of transformations or significant changes that they have experienced. And the internet, uh, the social media platforms uh, kind of picked up on that mini trend as it developed at the end of the year. And people, some of you may yourselves have done this, were posting pictures of what they looked like or what they were doing in 2010 and then comparing it with perhaps new pictures of what they were now doing or what was different in their lives. In many cases, very dramatic transformations, whether it was physical transformations, they had grown up or grown larger or grown smaller or grown older, or it could have been dramatic changes in their relationships. They were single in 2010 and now they're married with three children and look at how much their lives have changed. Or perhaps it was something that had been accomplished or completed some goal. They finished school and now they've got a job or they've switched careers to something new that they're more passionate about. It seemed if you looked at these pictures like part of the premise or part of the goal was to make the current picture be staged or posed in the same arrangement as the previous one. And and perhaps that's done intentionally, if not subconsciously, for people to be able to see visually or to experience the dramatic change because this is the same person in the same pose 10 years later looking very dramatically changed or transformed. It kind of underscores or, or punctuates the point that people were trying to make. Now, the text that we take up for today, this passage from the Gospel of John, talks about or introduces a time of what will become 
dramatic, life-altering transformation for a group of young people that lived 2,000 years ago, Jesus' first disciples, people who were beginning new lives that would look very different than the lives that they were leaving behind. New relationships, new sense of purpose, new meaning in their lives, new life plan. Now, if they had had social media back in that day, we could imagine what the before and after posted pictures might look like for some of these folks. The, the selfie with John the Baptist at the River Jordan going, hey, this is me and John B. at the River Jordan. And, and compared with, this is me and my new Messiah, Jesus, a year later. Or, or perhaps it's a picture of, um, here's me fishing with my brother and my dad on the Sea of Galilee, and now here's a picture of me fishing for men and women on the highways and byways around Nazareth. Or maybe even for someone like Simon Peter, a picture, this is me when I was known as Simon, and here's me after I was rebranded as Peter, my new name and my new identity to go with my new life. The text, even without those imagined pictures, does describe the kind of dramatic transformation that would be underscored if we could do so visually in that way. Young people, men and many women as well, who were part of the millennial generation or the Gen Z generation of their day, looking for new meaning in their lives, willing to take the risk to go looking for that new meaning in their lives and hoping to find it in someone like Jesus. And not only willing to take the risk to go looking for it, but to make the sacrifice to commit themselves to the life that they were now being called to live. And so we read in the text, taking it up at verse 35, the next day John was with two of his disciples. When John saw Jesus passing by, he said to those disciples, Look, it's the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard John say this, they followed Jesus. John is there at the Jordan River baptizing. Many of the people who have gone shopping for a Savior, who have gone out to see and hear John preach and teach and be baptized for the repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, many of them are wondering, could John be the Messiah that we have been looking for. John is trending on social media. He is right. There are lots of reports about what's going on, not just with people who are looking for the meaning, but for the people who are trying to tamp down on this possibly being the Messiah because that was going to draw unwelcome attention from the, gov the uh, pressing Roman government of that day. And so John, in that context, says, I know all the attention's on me, but as soon as Jesus walks past, he goes, it's not me, it's him you are looking for. Look, the Lamb of God, John says, that's who you're looking for, not me. Go follow him. And John's disciples did. They went and followed Jesus. Jesus turned, we read in verse 38, and saw them following and asked, what are you looking for? What are you looking for, Jesus asked. And we know because the text tells us that it's four o'clock in the afternoon that we might surmise that some of them are looking for something to eat, maybe even a place to stay. It's getting late. They've probably been out there all day. Um, there's no money in itinerant ministry, and there's very little money involved for those who are out looking to become disciples of itinerant ministers. So 
these folks are looking for someone who's going to take them in as a primary goal for themselves. They, they may be woke, but they're also broke. And so Jesus says, what are you looking for? And what are any of us, what are any of us looking for? Beyond what our culture tells us we should be looking for, wealth and power, beyond any of the things that we might be craving for our own personal satisfaction, the kinds of pleasures and comforts of this world, beyond those things, what are we looking for? Love? Companionship? Hope? Comfort? Peace? Whatever that looks like, whether it's peace in our personal relationships, peace in our world. Maybe a sense of purpose for some of us. A sense of meaning. Maybe we're just looking for answers, the questions that are rattling around in our head or in our souls. We can imagine ourselves, imagine yourself. Jesus is walking by, and we're walking after Jesus, and Jesus turns around and says, what are you looking for? It's the invitation that all of us long to hear. It's the one time you've got the chance to ask that eternally unanswerable question, and what, what would we ask Jesus if we had the opportunity to answer that question? What are we looking for? We might start with the who questions. Who are you? Or are you who they say that you are? When? When is this all going to happen? We ask that even today. When are you coming again? When is this world going to be done being transformed as it's being transformed? When is creation going to finally experience the salvation that has been promised. We might ask the what questions. What's it really going to be like in heaven? What's really going to happen? Or the why questions. Why must there be sin? Why the suffering? Why the death? Or the how questions. How's this all going to happen? How can I know for sure? How can I know if I don't see a dove floating down from heaven and landing on my head that the Holy Spirit is really walking with me in this life? Andrew doesn't ask any of those questions. He doesn't ask who or what or why or how or when. Andrew asks where. Andrew asks where. Verse 38 continues, they said to Jesus, Rabbi, where are you staying? Where? They call Jesus Rabbi, which means teacher, but not the kind of teacher that we might conjure up in our imagination, not the kind of teacher who turns to the blackboard and, or whatever they're using now and, and putting the lesson up for the children to ask questions and then turning around and they deal with the lesson and then everyone goes home to their separate homes. But a teacher in Jesus' day who was someone who was a, a leader of followers, who, who sat at his feet and learned not just what to think or what to believe, but how to apply it to your life, and then would go out and apply it. The disciples were more like apprentices, learning daily, submitting themselves to the authority of their rabbi, and living with and traveling and journeying with him as they learned and grew as disciples. And so it makes sense that Andrew would ask, where? Where are you staying so I can go get my bag from wherever I have been with John and move it to be with you so that now I can begin a new journey and a new life 
as your disciple, Jesus. And Jesus said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was and remained with him. Now we're laboring, we, we labor today under the false assumption that before we become Christians that we have to know certain things or that we have to believe certain things, that we have to be a kind of person or to perform at some kind of demonstrable level of proficiency in some way, don't we? The text blows that theory out of the water. Jesus doesn't test Andrew on his readiness to be a disciple. He doesn't say, here's the test that you have to take before you can be admitted to my school of disciples. Jesus doesn't make them demonstrate some minimum level of holiness, saying, hey, I know you guys were out carousing last Friday night, and that's just not going to do for my disciples. Go clean up your act and then come back and we'll talk some more. Jesus doesn't look for references from their previous discipleship gigs. And mind you, John the Baptist is right over there in shouting distance, and Jesus is going, hey, John, how did these guys do when they were your disciples? Doesn't ask him that. Jesus says, come and see. Come and see. Now, Jesus also doesn't make any promises about what this relationship, this shared life, this journey, this way of being and believing and doing is going to turn out. Jesus doesn't make any of those kind of promises to us either about what it's going to take to cut it as a disciple or the things that we might be asked to do or to give up doing, which may be very difficult which may be very hard, which may not be pleasant, which may not yield for us the kinds of things that other people promise in certain kinds of gospels that are being peddled even today in our culture of, of health and wealth and prosperity. And that's not what Jesus promises to us. He invites and extends to all who would follow after him by faith the same invitation to relationship, to abide with him. Come and see where I'm staying. Come and be with me as we move forward and journey together. Why? Because Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the way to God. I am the way and the truth and the life. Come and see what that life will be. Verse 40, one of the two was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And verse 41, the first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought Simon to Jesus. First thing that Andrew does with his newly transformed wife, with his newly minted certificate as a new disciple of Jesus, is to go and share the good news with the people that he knew, his friends, his brother, the folks in his immediate circle. And says, not I have found the rabbi, just another one of the many teachers who were who were active in that day, but I have found the Messiah. We found the one, Simon. Come and see. Andrew has already been radically transformed, and Simon is up next. Simon, who's going to be immediately renamed Peter, the rock, the foundation upon which Jesus will build his church Andrew didn't wait until his life was figured out to go do that. He didn't care whether it was hip or popular. He didn't care whether or not it was done decently in an order with committee approval. He just went 
and shared the good news. So what are we waiting for? Jesus says to us, what are you looking for? What are we looking for? We know what he's going to say, which is come and see. Come and see. If you want to know the word made flesh, come and see Jesus. If you want to know what love is like, come and see Jesus. If you want to experience God's glory, to be filled with the bread of life, to be, have your thirst be quenched by living water, be born again to abide in love, to behold the light of the world in the darkness in which we live, to experience that life and that relationship with your Savior, to enter into not just this life of abundance, but an eternal life to come. If you want to know God and God's glory, come and see Jesus.